السلام عليكم بالنسبة للي بيسألون على الصوت إن شاء الله دقيقة ونبدي إذا الله سهل دكتور انس اذا تحب خلي نبدي ان شاء الله ان شاء الله السلام عليكم جميعا وجمعه مباركه عليكم ان شاء الله اليوم نبتدا المحاضره دوره التعليم المستمر اليوم المحاضره الثالثه ولكم ليديز اند جنتلمان اور ليكتشرر توداي از دكتور احمد حامد طبعاً دورة التعليم المستمر هي برعاية الأستاذ الدكتور رغد عبد الرزاق الهاشمي عميد كلية طب الأسنان وبإشرافي أنا شخصياً رئيس فرع معالجة وتجميل الأسنان الدورة كان مدتها أو هي حالياً مدتها خمسة أيام كانت أكو محاضرة الأولى كانت من قبل الأستاذ الدكتور حسين الحويزي وأنا نطيت المحاضرة الثانية يوم أمس واليوم إن شاء الله دكتور أحمد حامد ويانا أسستنت بروفيسور دكتور أحمد حامد علي He has his PDS degree in 1997 and his MSc in Conservative Dentistry in 2003 and also he had his PhD degree in 2017 from King's College, London, United Kingdom Uh, Dr. Ahmed published uh, different uh, papers, scientific papers, in different aspects of endodontics, and he has uh, clinical trials in pulp uh, preservation. Uh, and his interest, research interest, is about the minimum invasive techniques for pulp preservation in endodontics and uh, bioactive material. Tfadl, Dr. Ahmed, if you want to Uh, thank you, Dr. Anas, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to ask if the voice is, is it clear? Is it clear? Yes, yes, it's yeah. good. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our subject today, or my lecture, will be a very long lecture, so probably I will divide it into two parts. The first part will be about uh, the devitalization of teeth, what are, what are the disadvantages, what are the best substitute and then uh, uh, probably tomorrow uh, if i did not complete today uh, we will talk about the different procedures of vital pulp therapy so vital pulp therapy as a minimal invasive endodontics approach uh, let me move with the first fact there are many teeth or frequently teeth with deep caries lesion remember deep caries lesion unnecessary devitalized and treated endodontically based on what? On the contemporary classification. So we have a contemporary classification of the uh, pulp uh, status and uh, treatment decisions depend on this classification. So if you have a reversible pulpitis, you will have a treatment decisions. And if you have Uh, reversible pulp, irreversible pulpitis, you will have another treatment decision. The drawback of this is that if the clinical diagnosis of a curiously involved tooth was a reversible pulpitis, then the clinician most likely would open into a tooth even though there was no pulp exposure after complete caries removal. So he removed the caries, there is no pulp exposure, and even with pulp exposure, Just based on a clinical diagnosis, which is irreversible pulpitis, he opened the tooth and devitalized it. So if you see these teeth, which have a deep caries lesion, probably you will treat them with root canal treatment. You have this tooth, deep caries, you expect that the caries is reaching the pulp, causing irreversible pulpitis, and uh, the, the pulp have no capability to heal. So you go on with the treatment option of root canal treatment. 
pulpectomy followed by root canal filling. Similar to this tooth, this tooth as well. So based on radiographs, you may do a root canal treatment uh, based on the depth of the lesion. But they exhibited normal vitality with cold testing and all were treated successfully with vital pulp therapy. So based on contemporary classification and treatment decision, the pulp condition of the pulp condition, the, uh, the two uh, most familiar international association, which is the American Association of Endodontists and the European Society of Endontology, recommend to perform pulpectomy, which is devitalization and removing of all the pulp, followed by a root canal filling for a tooth diagnosed clinically with irreversible pulpitis. So this is the current recommendation to deal with teeth that have an irreversible pulpitis diagnosed, uh, clinically diagnosed. So the question, is there another option to treat symptomatic partially irreversibly inflamed pulp other than devitalization followed by root canal filling? Um, during my research, uh, uh, I, I did a research with my colleague, Dr. Anas. Uh, we did not publish the data yet, but we are going to submit it soon. It's uh, to explore the attitude of Iraqi dentists toward the diagnosis, the treatment option, materials used, and the management of exposed pulp. So you're facing a lot of cases with exposed pulp. What you will do? So what's your option? what you will do for diagnosis procedure? What's your treatment option? What's the material used? So uh, that was the aim. And the result, we see that 45% of dentists, of survey dentists who participate in the survey, choose to do RCT for asymptomatic exposed pulp. Asymptomatic exposed pulp. So. 45% devitalization rate for, for exposed pulps, asymptomatic exposed pulp. I did not choose to ask them about the symptoms, which probably they will choose uh, root canal treatment or pulpectomy with root canal treatment uh, with high percentage. But if you, if you see the results, it's 45% with, uh, will choose RCT. Also, we did found that vital pulp therapy, we, we, we combine all other uh, options, which is the direct pulp capping, partial pulpotomy, full pulpotomy, as a vital pulp therapy treatment. And uh, choosing this treatment was significantly associated with being an endodontist, because endodontists may be aware about the position statements that were released uh, a few years ago. Uh, which recommend another options to deal with deep carious lesion or exposed pulps. And also person who work in academia, uh, they have high chances to choose vital pulp therapy instead of root canal treatment. Uh, and, and the OR, which is the odd ratio, refer to the chances to choose a vital pulp therapy treatment for this case instead of root canal treatment. So being an endodontist, it will be 2.8 odd ratio uh, to choose a vital pulp therapy, uh, a respondent work in academia, and a respondent with a PhD degree. So knowledge about the pathology of the pulp and um, the histopathology of the, of the pulp with, with carious lesion, when there is an exposure, how to deal with the pulp uh, need knowledge. And a lot of dentists, they don't know about this. They just stick to the mechanical uh, idea of treating with teeth. So I just want to, to show you this um, results uh, to move on with what I will present uh, in a few minutes. So today uh, I was checking the Facebook and I see on Style Italiano, uh, one of the dentists, Iraqi dentist, he uh, posts this uh, case, which uh, I leave it for your judgment to see whether it's savable or not. So 
uh, you have an x-ray of course there is an extra root or something like this and you have um, a pulp wound that looks I don't know the diagnosis criteria he used and what the diagnosis he reached, but it seems that the pulp is savable and there is a, a, a clotting and stopping of blood with with uh, red tissue that clearly it's not necrotic or inflamed. And I will talk about the bleeding factor, the bleeding criterion during the vital pulp therapy, how it's important to determine the irreversibility of the inflammation. So as you can see, you reach this stage and then move on to removing the pulp, removing all the pulp hair from the canals. And he go on with this and then end up with this. So this is a devitalization process which called pulpectomy. And this should be followed by a root canal filling. Well, this is the, uh, the AAE and the ESE, the standard procedure for irreversible pulpitis. But uh, uh, with the evidence emerging, I think there will be a change of these uh, recommendations in the uh, near future. So the structure of my lecture will be, first of all, I will, I will talk about the the disadvantage of devitalization of a tooth which have a vital pulp, probably it can be saved with the new approach uh, in the literature. And we'll talk about the apical periodontitis, which is the consistent problem uh, of uh, related with root canal treatments. And uh, there is term, a funny term called toxic tooth. So uh, we'll talk about disadvantage, association uh, between epical periodontitis, cardiovascular disease, residual infection, root canal treatments, and prevalence of AP or epical periodontitis among endodontically treated teeth, the concept of toxic tooth, and then we'll move on to uh, vital pulp therapy advantage, indication, and procedures. So I hope the time is enough to deal with all uh, these stuff. I just want to, to educate some of the probably a new dentist about this, uh, about uh, this concept, which is the devitalization. What's the consequences of it? So what was the all time purpose of devitalizing a tooth? What is the purpose if you want to devitalize a tooth? The purpose is to eliminate pain, right? So pain elimination and make the tooth symptomless. However, we will end up with an empty channel, which is, or empty tube, which is the root canal space that need to be filled to prevent bacterial ingress and subsequent apical periodontitis. So uh, in order to prevent or heal apical periodontitis, we need to fill these empty channels or tubes. So, my question, do you think that the root canal treatments, procedures, and material are adequate to maintain a biologically healthy periodontia, or let's say epical periodontia? What are the disadvantage of devitalizing teeth? There are many disadvantages for devitalizing uh, the pulp. First of all, elimination of proprioceptive protection and this will double the occlusal load needed to provoke a neuromuscular response. This will increase the possibility of fracture. So if you have two teeth in uh, each one in one side, uh, one with root canal treatment, uh, non-vital, and the other one is vital and uh, functioning well. So you will need double the occlusal loads to provoke the neuromuscular response on the endodontically treated tooth, and this will increase the chances of a fracture. RCT also weakens tooth structure, which is known because we need to remove a lot of tooth structure to reach the area that are inaccessible. 
and it's also consumes time, expensive, and teeth need full coverage restoration, which add extra removal of tooth structure. RCT eliminate tooth sensitivity, which increase danger of mechanical and thermal injury to the tooth. So sensitivity may be uh, beneficial in avoiding the uh, exacerbation of uh, mechanical and thermal injury. Recently, a higher percentage of endodontically treated teeth was found to be associated with periapical radiolucency by using CBCT versus PA radiograph. This suggests that we, uh, that they are infected and the success rate is lower than what was reported using PA radiograph. Uh, and a study by our colleague Nasser and Noemi uh, has found that one year success in molars was 75% only using a CBCT in the UK based post-grad clinic. So it's UK based post-grad clinic which should have uh, a qualified uh, dentist and also uh, a high level supervisors. And still there's only 75% success rate. Also a considerable proportion of endonuclear treated teeth associated with secondary infection, which requiring root canal retreatment. And uh, this uh, I will talk about with the association with cardiovascular disease. Changes in root canal geometry are inevitable and the course of canal preparation and may lead to a higher incidence of fracture. Similar to crown fracture, we have root fractures due to change in geometry and of root canal treatment, which, which we created because there is a problem in dentistry, which is all the materials are uh, inadequate to fill the structure of the natural tooth we have shortcoming in our materials that make us to do preparations for them. Uh, like in amalgam restorations, they don't retain in the cavity unless we do a retention form. Similar in root canal treatments, we need to shape the canal to receive a specific size of obturating material to fill this space. So we need shaping, we need cutting. So the problem is dental materials are not enough to uh, occupy the function of natural structures. Tooth discoloration and increased care risk because of lack accumulation and alkaloid microflora due to absence of defense of the pulp dentin complex. I'll show you a study uh, the difference between defense of, of vital tooth and non-vital tooth against bacteria. There was a comparable, this is an interesting study. Uh, uh, this study uh, assessed uh, the VPT treatment and RCT treatment in two arm, in two group of patients with irreversible pulpitis, okay? So after five years, there was no difference in survival of teeth with VPT and RCT, which is interesting. And the presence of preoperative periapical radiograph was not associated with failure. So if there is a periapical lesion or not, the, fail, uh, the success rate was comparable between the two procedures. So the question why we devitalize teeth diagnosed with irreversible pitis, even with the presence of PA rarification. So these are uh, the disadvantage of devitalization of the pulp, if it was vital. Uh, a study by uh, NG et al. Uh, assessed the success rate of primary root canal or endodontic treatment, which is the, the first uh, treatment of root canal treatment, uh, not after the failure, which is the secondary root canal treatment, and this range between 68 and 85 using, using PA radiograph. We should focus under this point. PA radiograph does not give you the exact situation. Imagine the number if we use CBCT. 
And this is a primary root canal treatment have two division. Uh, either you treat a vital tooth or you treat non-vital tooth. So another study found that for vital teeth, it was 82% compared to 78% in a non-vital tooth using periapical radiographs. So uh, there are uh, chances that 20% will go on with a persistent or secondary infection. So why apical periodontitis develop or per persist? Uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, uh, common to see apical periodontitis in root canal treated teeth. So post the treatment apical periodontitis, usually which may be radiographically undetectable, may develop or persist as a defense mechanism to prevent the systemic spread of bacteria and uh, their byproducts, as uh, have been mentioned by my colleague, Dr. Hussein and Dr. Anas yesterday. So in order to prevent the spread of bacteria, systemic spread, so there will be an apical periodontitis. So the question, are we eliminating all microorganisms in apical area by instrumentation and irrigation? And if not, uh, what the fate of these entombed micro microorganisms? Are they are harmless, harmless, or uh, and not causing a chronic inflammation in periapical area? So uh, this study, which assessed the microbial status in the apical part of the root canal system, found that there are 14 out of 16 endodontically treated teeth revealed residual intracanal infection after instrumentation, antimicrobial irrigation, and obturation. And the microbes were located in accessible areas. Uh, and uh, these areas uh, are present in the main canal, in the intercanal isthmus, and the accessory canals, mostly as biofilms. Uh, eliminating bacteria from apical area in cases with infection is challenging most of the time. Uh, two approaches suggested to end our preparation. Uh, first of all, is to confine the canal preparation to apical construction, which have the maximum healing. And the second approach is to ensure patency through the apical construction. However, both approaches do not access and reach the lateral canal complex ramification in the apical two millimeter of the root, which leaving a substantial area uncleaned and insufficiently debride. As you can see here, uh, the complexity of root canal space uh, and uh, the area that cannot reach with the mechanical phase and the uh, chemical phase of the uh, root canal treatment procedure. And we expect that there are some uh, bacteria will remain there and cannot be removed. So the residual infection after post-treatment canal treatment, there, are, there is no in vivo evidence to support that the assumption that uh, these bacteria can be entombed effectively in the canal system by root filling and thus be rendered uh, harmless. How post-treatment AP is prevalent? So uh, there are many studies to assess the prevalence of apical periodontitis among uh, root canal treated teeth in different populations. Uh, histologic observation uh, which is uh, extraction of teeth, cutting of the apical part probably, and uh, examine it under histology, histology, we will see that there are about 50 to 90% of teeth were associated with uh, post-treatment apical periodontitis. And this is histological observation, which cannot be done routinely in the clinics. Uh, Otherwise, we depend on, sorry, we depend on radiographic observation, which shows that about 40-50% of endodontically treated teeth were associated with epical periodontitis. This indicates that endodontic post-treatment disease is a common finding. Uh, a study in Dutch population, 
they found that about quarter of endodontically treated teeth associated with apical periodontitis. In the French population, they found that uh, the prevalence of apical periodontitis in root canal treated teeth was 33%. Uh, another study in 2019 uh, to assess prevalence of apical periodontitis found that about 20,836 teeth have been assessed in this study with CBCT. The previous studies were with, with PA, and this is with CBCT. What they found that the prevalence of apical periapical peri lesion was significantly larger in root full teeth, which is 55.5%, which is half of the endodontically treated teeth have an apical periodontitis, or at least what we call it radiographically diagnosed periapical lesion. But I will explain later, if you can see a periapical lesion in the CBCT, mean that it will be apical periodontitis lesion histologically. Because there's an interesting study done by my supervisor, uh, which is Professor Manocci, has shown that if you see a periapical lesion in CBCT, mean that it's uh, an apical periodontitis lesion histologically. So the evidence to the presence of a chronic infection after RCT is the slow healing rate, which take months or years compared to that after extraction, which is the radical elimination of infection. This indicates the incomplete immediate eradication of infection after root canal treatment, which is taking a, a chronic type of inflammation or infection. Therefore, if we do a root canal treatment, we need to uh, follow up the symptoms and should be examined radiographically during a follow-up period for up to four years before decide whether there is a healing or not or uh, uh, an emerging of post-treatment uh, disease or post-treatment of uh, root canal uh, filling procedure. So uh, my question for you, did you were aware, uh, aware about the prevalence of, or fi prevalence figures of apical periodontitis in endodontically treated teeth before? It's, it's a huge uh, percentage of prevalence to see that 55% of teeth associated with apical periodontitis. I, I don't say it's, it's uh, happened because of root canal treatment. Probably root canal treatment used to treat this. But uh, at the end or the bottom of uh, information, we see that apical periodontitis is prevalent among teeth with uh, root canal treatment. Remember, uh, I was talking about clinical and radiographical measures, which we are, as a dentist, use it to assess our outcome. But these measures, which is the clinical science symptoms of the tooth and the x-rays, which is the radiographs, we take it, are already limited in their detection ability. So uh, clinical assessment is limited because uh, there is no association between the clinical measures and histological measures. And also radiographical measures are also limited. So what about the molecular level in terms of the toxin release and inflammatory mediators? relationship between radiographically diagnosed apical periodontitis and systemic disease. Uh, I'm taking you through this journey to show you uh, some of the propositions of, of medical uh, community about the root canal treatment. Whether it's correct or not correct, we need as a dentist to know about it. So both coronary uh, or, or cardiac vascular disease and endodont infections share similar inflammatory mediator as have been explained uh, that 
by Dr. Anas yesterday that there are some inflammatory mediators during the uh, inflammation of or infection of periapical area and the initiation or progression of disease process. So ca uh, cardi cardiovascular disease and endodontic infection share the similar mediators. These are studies uh, done to assess the, uh, the ADMA level uh, and the interleukin-2, uh, which might suggest that existence of an early endothelial dysfunction in young adults with apical periodontitis. So apical periodontitis have similar uh, inflammatory mediators to a cardiovascular problem. Another study also found that uh, the available evidence is limited but consistent, suggesting that apical periodontitis is associated with these inflammatory mediators. And uh, these findings suggest that apical periodontitis may contribute to a systemic immune response not confined to the localized lesion, which potentially leading to an increase in systemic inflammation. So there is a systemic inflammation due to apical periodontitis. Association between apical periodontitis and cardiovascular disease is well uh, established and there is significant association. Again, a uh, person with apical periodontitis more likely to have uh, cardi cardiovascular disease than subject without apical periodontitis by five folds. And uh, the question then is apical periodontitis or root canal treatment procedure associated with, co with cardiovascular disease risk? This is the most important question. Isn't RCT used to treat apical periodontitis? So to assess the association, they found no association between the cardiovascular problems and the chronic apical periodontitis associated with teeth that have uh, endodontic treatment. So uh, this was done in 2014, and there is ongoing research on this field and this point to see if there is any relation between cardiovascular problems or any other systemic problems and root canal treatment procedure. So in the last years, we see a, a term called toxic tooth by uh, uh, a cardiologist and a dentist. And this term explained to people how a root canal could be making you sick. I, uh, I have added uh, an interview with the author of the book. I want you to see it and uh, see what's their judgment for the situation. Sorry, Dr. Anas. Okay, okay, just a minute. Root canals are done and recommended by the dentist when you come in with severe tooth. Uh, is it okay? I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay. Pain. So it's usually a pain relief scenario. And that pain is due to the fact that the tooth has gotten infected. The inside pulp has got pathogens. Maybe a little abscessing has taken place around the tip of the tooth. And their approach then is to relieve your pain. And in the course of doing that, they literally take off the top of the tooth, route out the nerve and the blood supply. Basically, they take the life force out of the tooth. I mean, there's still live tooth at the tip of it where it goes into the bone. But the upper part of the tooth has essentially, and this is not meant to be overly dramatic, has essentially been embalmed. Okay, you, you take out the nerve and the blood supply. And when you do that, most of the time, you also take out the nerves that are causing the pain. 
So the patient gets paid relief, they're happy, but they now have inside their jawbone a chronically infected tooth with anaerobic pathogens making a large amount of toxins and chewing on it so that these things get effectively delivered throughout the body through the lymphatic supply and the venous blood supply. So from the symptomatic point of view, it's an effective procedure. It relieves pain, but from a physiological point of view, there can be few things more catastrophic than a root canal because of the pathogens and toxins that are allowed to proliferate in, inside them. And when this work was initially done, Dr. Huggins was working in conjunction with Dr. Boyd Haley out of the University of Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Haley put the foreword on our book. Dr. Huggins coordinated with a number of other dentists around the country to send all their extracted root canal treated teeth to Dr. Haley. And Dr. Haley devised a test that assayed five different important human enzymes that are used in the production of energy. And he was able to take these root canal, root canal extractions and put them in progressive water soaks and then assay that water, 100% of those specimens had enormous amounts of highly potent toxins, many of them on the order of a thousand fold times more toxic than botulism when assayed against these enzymes. And lest anyone think, well, maybe that was just pathogens in the mouth and it got contaminated when you pulled it out. Well, they also looked at teeth that had been extracted for orthodontic reasons. In other words, just make more room for your teeth to grow out. And so you basically take out a normal tooth, no evidence of infection. Well, all of those teeth were completely negative. So they had that control. And then to make it even more compelling, Dr. Haley assayed in this fashion from around the country, more than 5,000 extracted root canal teeth and 100% of them had these toxins. So this is why Dr. Kulatz and I call the root canal procedure a fatally flawed procedure. It's not flawed in the sense that it won't relieve pain. As I said, you take out the nerve and blood supply, you'll often eliminate the pain, but you absolutely assure, even if it wasn't present before, that you'll always end up with a chronic infected tooth. And when it's in the molar area and you chew on it with the enormous pressures that the jawbone can, can generate, you push those pathogens and toxins into the bloodstream. <clears throat> a lot of us, including Dr. Huggins, knew this for a long time, but what makes this book compelling is in the last couple of years, there have been some incredible studies done in the literature this one group in finland actually studied patients that had heart attacks and that in angiography they got the blood clot causing the heart attack suctioned out so they aspirated these blood clots that caused the heart attack and they analyzed these blood clots for the typical dna that's associated with pathogens and root canals and gum disease. These clots had a huge concentration of these oral pathogens inside the clot, 16 fold more concentrated than, than in the blood that they came from. Now, you see in the literature, lots of people like to say, oh, well, this, this is a correlation, this is uh, an association. I think anybody that can look at this evidence and say that this huge concentration of pathogens and toxins inside the blood clot that forms to cause a heart attack is a correlation no more and not a cause and effect is just being irrational. I mean, you don't, you don't form a blood clot and then magically after the fact, pathogens or toxins from somewhere suddenly accumulate in the blood clot. They accumulate, it causes the clot to form, and it's some of the most smoking gun evidence that we've ever seen that shows that these pathogens and toxins in the root canal teeth and the gums, when you chew down, they glow into the bloodstream. 
They pass through the venous system and the pulmonary arteries, but the reason why they get in the coronary arteries is because the coronary artery is the first high pressure part of the vascular system that these pathogens and toxins reach. Everywhere else it's low pressure. So the I, you'll often eliminate the pain, but you have more concentrated than, than in the blood that they came from. Now, you see in the literature, lots of people like to say a heart attack is a correlation, no more, and not a cause and effect is just being irrational. I mean, you don't, you don't form a blood clot and then magically after the fact, pathogens or toxins from somewhere suddenly accumulate in the blood clot. They accumulate, it causes the clot to form, and it's some of the most smoking gun evidence that we've ever seen that shows that these pathogens and toxins in the root canal teeth and the gums, when you chew down, they glow into the bloodstream, they pass through the venous system and the pulmonary arteries, but the reason why they get in the coronary arteries is because the coronary artery is the first high pressure part of the vascular system that these pathogens and toxins reach. Everywhere else it's low pressure. As Soon as they hit the left ventricle, come out high pressure and you get a mechanical effect in, in, in addition to a, a continuous exposure and these pathogens take hold. And in fact, modern cardiology, my fellow cardiologists, internists, family practice doctors, they now do accept that all coronary heart disease is due to inflammation of the coronary artery. But amazingly enough, they stop asking questions there like, well, why does this inflammation develop? And this inflammation develops almost 100% from pathogens. And 90 to 95% of the time, those pathogens come from root canals and infected gums. So the bottom line being, I can tell you, most of my colleagues, they check the cholesterol, they lower that, they treat the blood pressure, they manage all the quote unquote risk factors of coronary heart disease and this will lessen your likelihood of having a heart attack the more you manage that but they almost always think then that when you manage all of those risk factors as effectively as they can be managed and the patient still goes ahead and has a heart attack truth be known what they think is that's just an unlucky patient and I'm telling you, luck has nothing to do with it. Until cardiologists, internal medicine doctors, and family practice doctors realize that the most common cause of death, heart attack and heart disease in the world, is caused, caused greater than 90% of the time by dental infections, most of the time in a root canal treated tooth. Hopefully, the doctors will realize this and want to protect their patients a little bit better, and then they can be the force, hopefully down the road, that puts the pressure on the dentist to basically eliminate this procedure. At the very least, and we talk about this in the book, this needs to be a fully informed consent before somebody has this. I mean, when you go get a surgery, you're told, well, I could have a heart attack, I could get an infection, I could lose a limb, this, that, or the other, but that's okay. I want the surgery, I'm going to take my shot. Well, they now have in the dental literature, believe it or not, in the dental literature, a survey that shows patients that have one or more root canals in their mouth, not failed root canals, not poorly done procedures, they just have a root canal in their mouth, they have a greater chance of heart disease and heart attack. People need to be told this before they get the procedure. I'm not gonna say, and I wouldn't begin to say that there aren't a lot of people out there with root canals that are doing fine, but I can tell you, flip it around, almost all of the ones that aren't doing well have the root canals too. So 
Are you going to be the one that somehow tolerates the root canal well, or are you going to be the one where the root canal causes a heart attack? I think people should know that. And dentists should know that and appreciate that so that they can fully inform their patients. And much of the time, if you have an infected tooth, you should go straight to extraction because you're just increasing the risk enormously for that person's long-term health. Uh, well, thank you for listening to this. Uh, Dr. Anas, uh, do we have a questions to be answered or, or not? Do we continue? Uh, yes, Dr. Ahmed, I'm really impressed with your uh, lecture and I have uh, some questions for you. Yeah, please. Uh, I think your, your uh, lecture will make the surgeon happy because they will extract all teeth rather than we do the uh, endodontic treatment. <laughs> the, the implantologists will be happy. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 not a, it's not a way from propaganda for implants. Uh, so, yeah, of course, yeah. uh, probably, probably there is some propaganda behind it, but it's, it's, it's a mere research and uh, yeah. the final decision will be uh, on research. It's, uh, root canal treatment is a very important procedure, but uh, we are, as a dentist, we need to look forward and uh, to see the limits in our procedures. I mean, I mean, uh, faulty dentistry or um, what they called old fashioned dentistry filled, filled with faulty procedures. So uh, we need to address that and we should confess there are shortcoming, shortcomings in our materials and uh, the procedure that we need to do it to accommodate the properties or characteristics of our dental material. So the problem with the material, and uh, we don't have other option in the future, maybe other options to do with that, to deal with, with, with the problem of losing teeth or keeping teeth in the mouth, uh, instead of doing uh, some procedure that may objected by other communities like medical community and put the association with a cardiovascular problems on the dentist. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot of, it's a multifactorial problem uh, related with genetics, with other factors, but they uh, put the problem, uh, at least the speaker, Dr. Levy, on the, on the dentist. Uh, yes, totally agree. Uh, I have some question for you from the audience. Um, yeah. uh, one question from Dr. Sharif. He thank you for your uh, informative lecture. And his question is, uh, are there any differences in the prevalence of apical periodontitis regarding the single visit root canal treatment to the multiple visit root canal treatment? Uh, well, it's difficult to assess the prevalence of apical periodontitis uh, in a uh, for a specific procedure. In this case, if you want to assess single visit versus multiple visits, you need to do a, a clinical trial, not a prevalence survey. The prevalence survey is to take the x-rays, radiographs of a, a population that represent the population and you examine each tooth and each endodontically treated tooth for the uh, presence of apical periodontitis. So in that case, you don't exactly what the procedure had been done for the, that tooth. But in order to assess, and I, I did find that uh, a lot of uh, references for this, uh, the single visit versus the multiple visit procedure for root canal treatment, uh, but in that case, it will be either a prospective study uh, in a specific center or uh, a, a randomized control clinical trial. Yeah, thank you, doctor. And also we have another question from our colleague, Dr. Samar. Uh, his question is, what is the source of leaking toxins associated with the endodontically treated tooth? Is it the filling materials or only the poor RCT? Well, uh, 
we have two axes or two sources or two factors that are associated with failure. Probably if we can say failure is leaking, which is associated probably due to leak. So we have a, a poor quality root canal treatment and we have a poor or a poor coronal restoration. There are uh, some papers assessed the association or the risk factor for failure of root canal treatment. And they found that poor quality root canal treatment, which is, uh, uh, which is um, the, the quality of the obturation in terms of the voids, if there is any voids in the obturation, in that case, we assess it by a radiograph, so we call it density of gutta perca. So if there is a problem in density of gutta perca, we will get a low chance of success and uh, a high chance for failure. Similarly, with, with working length or length of the falling material or gutta percha or sealer. And if the uh, uh, falling material is shorter than two millimeter from the radiographic epics, we will have higher chance for failure compared to the overfilling and the well-fitted uh, gutta perca or filling material. Also, we have other risk factor, which is the coronal restoration. Also, they did found that there is an association between bad coronal restoration and failure of gutta perca. So we have both sides of picture affecting the failure of the uh, root canal treatment. So coronal is important as well as the uh, radicular part. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, thank you, doctor. I think it's, um, it's a matter of uh, changing the direction of edu education is, um, because in our uh, schools and lectures, we have the responsibility of um, having or um, um, like directing the knowledge toward the what is recent in, in, in literature and what is the new approaches and treatment of teeth. And also for the, um, our colleague, uh, which have been graduated, these courses is the source for this new knowledge. And uh, because the difficulty in um, when you have an idea or a new idea is to convince the um, reader or the audience about it because they have already, uh, they work on it for a long time and they spend money for getting the skills and also having the equipments. So when they improve themselves in Indo, they still face the problem in the endodontically treated teeth from different uh, aspects, I think during the operation or after uh, when the patient go home, the post-op pain, and also after a period of time when the tooth is not recovered. So all these are problems. Uh, in addition to the tooth complexity, which is cannot be expected sometimes, and the uh, shortcomings of the tools and the materials which is used during the process. Uh, so all, all these can be avoided by much simpler, I think, uh, yeah. way of treatment. Yes, Dr. Anna. So my point here, uh, if you remember the pictures I show you of the case in the beginning of the lecture, which showing the pulp and the orifice of the canals, uh, uh, the, the dentist was, was working on the pulp as it's meant not to be here. It's not his place. So the pulp is there naturally, but he worked like it's an, uh, a foreign body. He need to extract it and he need to extirpate it as it's uh, have no function or just a cause of problem. On the other half, on the other side of the picture, it is very important for the tooth to prevent its infection, its inflammation, and to keep its proprioceptive function and defensive function. And instead of removing it, we should focus on preserving pulp. And this is the direction, the new direction of all endodontic societies. They focus on a preservation of a well 
uh, not inflamed remnant of the pulp in the canal to prevent an uh, inevitable infection after root canal treatment. Especially, uh, I'm not talking about well-experienced endodontists. Well-experienced endodontists, they can have a high success rate because the operator experience is one of the factors that affect the success of root canal treatment. But I'm talking about the way of thinking of the operator. The operator should think in a biological manner, not a mechanical manner. It's not just a tubes and you fill it. You should think about the biology. What's the consequences of removing a vital part of the tooth, which you can, which you can save it and prevent future problem and consequences. So we need to think about that. I'm not saying root canal treatment is, it's very important in some situations, but there are some alternatives. I want to show you today, uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, which was not acceptable to be treated with a vital part therapy before, just by root canal treatment, but there is a new evidence suggesting uh, the otherwise. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, we have also uh, questions. Uh, one question from uh, one of the audience uh, is what about the modern bioceramics and uh, therapeutic properties? What is the impact w uh, does this material on apical periodontitis? Well, these material are a new advancement in the material. They uh, have the approach which is different from the old material but by they are uh, a biomimetic material so they have uh, a biocompatibility and have a bioconductivity and uh, they uh, favor the uh, side of treatment to success even with pulpotomies pa complete pulpotomy partial pulpotomy direct pulp capping these materials shifted the side of outcome from complete failure to uh, a, a high success rate associated with the treatment of vital pulp therapy. So we need to think uh, to uh, exploit these material in situation where they can give us the best option, uh, which is reducing our surgical procedures to the minimum as good as possible and uh, try to think about the biological reaction of the of the of the of the tissue instead of substitute the tissue with uh, a, a mechanical or um, uh, non-vital uh, materials. Okay, uh, we have another question from uh, Professor Hussein Al Hawazi. It's he said that apical periodontitis is a chronic inflammation and periodontitis, uh, pre-implantitis, uh, tonsillitis, arthritis are also chronic inflammation. So how cardiac problem affected as 90% from apical periodontitis only, and so other chronic diseases may affect the heart? Well, uh, I, I'm not uh, defend, uh, defending the talk about uh, Dr. Levy, uh, maybe there is a, other, other sources of infection, but the infection of dental origin are specific because it's limited to a hard structure. So it's, uh, I, think, I think there is some uh, uh, difficulty for the body to deal with these hard structure. I mean, tonsillitis, uh, it's, it's open to oral cavity and there is soft tissue and there is no hard tissue. So the body have the ability to deal with the inflammation easily because of the swelling. Swelling can uh, prevent uh, the enclosement of the inflammation or infection. While in the bone, the situation is different and there is a continuous ingress from a dead tooth and the oral cavity, there are a lot of microorganisms as well as in the, in the pharynx and the tonsils, but I think because the, the difference of nature of the, of the structure. Yeah, and Dr. Uh, Professor Hussein Al-Hawazi also add that apical periodontitis 
is a result of an infection that by doing proper endodontics will heal and there are a huge number of healing cases yeah exactly that's right uh, but as i say experienced dentists can have a good results with endodontic procedure while an experienced dentist may have uh, a poor results and uh, could affect or impact the outcome of root canal treatment in total or in a population so uh, for, uh, my my point is if you have a pulp or a tooth with a vital pulp and you can save it it's worth to try and save it because there's a, a huge evidence uh, preferring or suggesting that uh, vital pulp therapy can be an alternative to root canal treatment in uh, these cases. Okay, and we have another question from one of the audience, uh, Salam Al Hulfi. He said, uh, "Where the cardiovascular infection disease come in well and well endodontically treated tooth?" Can you repeat the question, please? Where the cardiovascular disease come, or where the cardiovascular infection disease come in well endodontically treated tooth? Well, cardiovascular infection, it's happened in the coronary arteries, and the, the studies assess the association between the presence of cardiovascular disease and the infection associated with root canal treatments. So it's uh, it's an uh, association. It's not cause and effect. It's still an association between these two entities. Yes, uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Omar Al Jabouri. He thanks you for your informative lecture, and he said, "I see more studies." confirming uh, CBCTs detect apical periodontitis more than uh, periapical abscess, but in the discussion and their studies, they mentioned the radiolucency may related to scar tissue or it may uh, under, uh, it's may under healing, meaning it's now uh, smaller than in first situation, concluding even if there uh, there are an apical uh, or periapical lesion in CBCT, not meaning unnecessarily uh, uh, unsuccessfully treated root canal treatment. Yes, exactly. That's what I what I was talking about. That healing rate, uh, the healing of periapical lesion can occur, and it will become smaller and smaller. This indicates that uh, our treatment is doing a decrease in the uh, periapical lesion. But on molecular level, still there is an infection and still there is a bacteria. What's the systemic effect of these bacteria or this infection or this chronic persistent infection? We don't know. So uh, yes, healing, probably can occur for over uh, uh, years or months or years, but it's not fast with, uh, uh, as could as, uh, it's not fast enough to preclude or exclude that this is a chronic infection. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. We don't have more questions. You can proceed your lecture, thank you. Yeah. One of the new books you have is. So uh, this is a 22 uh, or 2020 study uh, assessing the my mitochondrial function and root fold teeth. And uh, they want to assess if the root canal treatment affecting the ATP activity, which is related with mitochondrial function and mitochondrial function related with uh, the health of the body. 
And the study design uh, was uh, limited, but they say that it is astonishing that a medical approach that has been practiced a million times, such as endodontic preservation of a dead tooth has, as far as we know, been clinically examined for first time to assess its effect on ATP activity on the mitochondrial membrane. And they take uh, an endodontically treated teeth, extract it, and put it in, in solution for 24 hours. And they assess the toxins that uh, release from these teeth uh, and uh, compare it with the control. And they found that uh, it's releasing a lot of toxins during 24 hours. And they suggest that the extent uh, presented also promote metabolic programming of reactive oxygen species and provoke important changes in the role of nuclear factor kappa uh, is an important question to be answered to further clinical studies. This is suggested for future, future studies, but the challenge posed by these discoveries is the need to raise awareness of the possible reduction in ATP activity by root filled teeth throughout the medical and dental communities. Again, they focus on the uh, toxins released by uh, root filled teeth and their association with mitochondrial function. So these are a bunch of studies I wanted to show you and see the scope of uh, other fields in medicine and how they can uh, interact with our uh, uh, branch of, of knowledge. Uh, another uh, point I would like to address is the restorative cycle of a tooth, which can be described as a death spiral. So the tooth start with an intact, to structure, and then uh, there will be a, a carious lesion uh, restored with restoration, and this will develop to MOD, and then a crown, and then endo, and then apical surgery, end up with extraction and implant. So they call it the money tooth cycle. The, the point I would like to address that we need to think about the biomimetic density versus the old fashioned density. The biomimetic density is meaning that we utilize the materials with the help of the physiologic function of tissue to acquire uh, or to perform our treatment instead of depending on old fashioned density, which may decrease the survival of the tooth by uh, propagation of problems from one problem to the other and end up with uh, 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 a final loss of the, of the tooth. So uh, they call it the death spiral of a tooth. So um, the second question, does vital pulp help the tooth in resisting bacterial infection of the internal tubules? So yes, we have this study which uh, assess the bacterial invasion into the internal tubules of a human vital and non-vital tooth. So uh, in order to assess that, they uh, make pulpectomies uh, for a bunch of teeth, which are bilateral third molars, one on the uh, right side and one on the left side. And they, on one side, they perform pulpectomies and root canal filling carried out and the other one left uh, as a vital tooth and uh, a class five cavity preparation was made on the teeth and left uncovered for 30 and 150 days. Uh, unprotected, the cavities were unprotected and there was a statistically significant difference in bacterial invasion rate between the vital and non-vital teeth. And as you can see in vital teeth, the bacterial penetration was uh, very minimum and the healthy tubules was 98.9% only in, invaded with bacteria compared to 39% of tubules of dental tubules infected with bacteria in non-vital teeth in a similar restorative situation, which is a class five. Just the vitality of the tooth is uh, different between the two groups. So we can now conclude that leaving non-infected vital pulp in a tooth is advantageous in preventing bacterial invasion. 
and proliferation within the dentinal tubules, lateral canals, the main root canal space, and preventing infection uh, of periradicular tissue. So uh, vital pulp therapy is the treatment aimed at preservation of compromised vital pulp. So we have a vital pulp that is compromised by caries, trauma, or restorative procedure. So the advantage of vital pulp therapy versus RCT in vital teeth with deep carious lesion. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm focusing on vital teeth with deep carious lesion. Pulp tissue is preserved, thus maintaining its physiologic and defensive function, preventing devitalization of, tooth, of teeth and subsequent infection. Less hard tissue, uh, tooth tissue is removed, which result in less weakening of the tooth and less cost and time. Previously, vital pulp therapy was believed that they are um, have less predictability compared to RCT. That's why the clinical recommendation, clinical statements focused on uh, treating teeth with irreversible pitis with a root canal treatment. We have some general consideration to be considered during uh, vital pulp therapy. First of all, as we have said, it's a preserve and maintain pulp health. It's indicated in permanent teeth with reversible pulpal injury, and new evidence suggests it can be used in irreversible pulpal uh, trauma. The objective is to initiate the formation of a new mineralized tissue. And the advancement of new materials and techniques have changed the idea of avoiding the pulp capping of carious pulp exposure. So we have uh, a new materials, which is the calcium silicate cements and bioceramics, that can help to promote the treatment outcome of vital pulp therapy. As we can say, uh, as we have been saying, that calcium silicate cement can uh, help uh, in promoting or uh, improving the outcome of vital pulp therapy. However, we have some diagnostic difficulties in determining the real pulp condition in a clinical setting because there is no relation between a clinical uh, findings and histological findings. So we have some difficulties still now, and it's, it's present in density and uh, for now. But based on a better understanding of pulp physiology and the caries microbiology and inflammatory mechanism, which are responsible for irreversible changes, teeth with potential for repair and continued volatility can now be more readily identify and predictably treated. So the indication for vital pulp therapy, first of all, we need to have a correct diagnosis, uh, which um, uh, play an important role in the outcome. So if we have incorrect diagnosis, we'll, we will end up with failure. Therefore, assessing the possible degree of inflammation or infection is required. However, it's challenging to assess the pulp health accurately using the clinical or available clinical test and distinguish between altered and healthy pulp. So the, two, uh, the tools we use it are the history and examination. We need to have a good history and a good examination for the symptoms of the, of the, of the patients. And we should perform sensibility tests, which is the cold and electric pulp testing to determine the pulp condition. However, we need to have in mind that there are some condition of the pulp with 10 to 16% of the result being false. But for now, it is acceptable by the European Society of Endontology to use sensibility tests to assess the pulpal condition in, in addition to the history and examination. Radiographs are also important However, CBCT are not justified for cases with vital pulp therapy because they have a, a lot of uh, X-ray dose, but they are helpful to assess the carious lesion depth and apical health and pathosis of the condition. We have an extra measure or extra factor that need to be uh, considered uh, in vital pulp therapy, which is the intraoperative bleeding after pulp exposure. This may reflect the level of inflammation of the pulp. Therefore, a continuous bleeding more than 10 minutes indicates the tissue are irreversible in inflammation. 
And to, uh, for the term, uh, for the diagnosis part of palpal condition, we have pain, which is signs symptoms. So some inflammation have no pain at all in case of asymptomatic uh, irreversible palpitis. We have cases that have irreversible palpitis histologically, but have no signs and symptoms. They call it asymptomatic irreversible palpitis. So we cannot relate pain to tissue damage, but it is mediated on the molecular level, which is not identifiable histologically. We have also clinical testing, which used to test the physiologic function of sensory nerves. So cold test and electric pulp testing is measuring the sensory nerve uh, and not the circulation, which indicate the vitality of the pulp. And we have histological findings by sectioning the tooth and see what's the status of the pulp. So the study is when they compare all these parameters, all are not related to each other. We have also some contraindication for vital pulp therapy. So uh, in case of history of pronounced and unprovoked pain symptoms or severe pain on percussion, on lingering or throbbing pain, it's not indicated for vital pulp therapy previously, but now there is an emerging evidence suggesting to do an extra procedures or extra steps during our treatment that enable us to see the level uh, of the inflammation, whether it's in the coronal part or in the radicular part. Sensibility testing, called, if we have no response, then it's non-vital. However, caution should be taken that immature or multi-rooted teeth uh, uh, may have a negative response, or uh, they have no response uh, in one root and the other routes may be vital. That's why it's preferred to coupled with electric pulp testing. Radiographically, we, we need uh, that the tooth is uh, free of periapical lesion to perform vital pulp therapy. However, there is a study suggests that there is no association between unsuccessful outcome and the presence of preoperative periapical radiolucency. So if you have a preoperative periapical radiolucency, uh, an irreversible pulpitis case, uh, probably you can uh, treat it uh, successfully. A bleeding after pulp exposure, a pro profuse and lingering hemorrhage had a significant poorer outcome than those with modest bleeding or bleeding of short duration. So the bleeding should be controlled within five to 10 minutes and not exceeding 10 minutes. This will indicate an irreversible inflammation. So if we cut through the coronal part of the pulp and we shave the pulp in case of partial pulpotomy, for example, we uh, look for the tissue and also we look for the uh, bleeding time. Also in cases of isolation difficulty or unrestorable teeth, because aesthetic management is required whether the pulp exposed or not. Factors does not affect success of VPT. Age, previously uh, the age was one of the factor to be recommended uh, uh, in uh, vital pulp therapy, to be considered in vital pulp therapy, is to do vital pulp therapy for younger age patients. Sex also have no uh, effect. Size of the pulp exposure have no effect on the outcome, and tooth type. Still, there is an evidence suggests higher success in molar compared to premolar because of colla collateral blood circulation. Factors that affect vital pulp therapy outcome. Uh, first of all, we have the first factor that determine the outcome of vital pulp therapy is diagnosis. So pulp tissue diagnosis is a provisional diagnosis. So when you have a clinical diagnosis of reversible or irreversible pulpitis, and you are going to do a vital pulp therapy, for example, direct pulp capping, or a partial pulpotomy or complete pulpotomy, remember that your first diagnosis is a provisional diagnosis and you will change it during the operation. So we call it an intraoperative diagnosis. So the first diagnosis is an educated judgment 
because there is no 100% correlation between the clinical and histological finding. A new classification proposed by Walter in 2017 to, uh, to deal with this problem uh, so the complete irreversibility of the coronal and reticular part has poor VPT outcome. If we have a reversible pitis in all the pulp, the coronal and the apical, in that case, the uh, VPT outcome will be very poor. Inability, uh, the second factor that determines the outcome of vital pulp therapy is the inability to identify and remove necrotic pulp tissue. That's why we need magnification. Because identifying these necrotic tissue is very important for the success and outcome of vital pulp therapy. Materials also have an effect. The type of the material, a new bioactive material like calcium silicate, significantly increase the outcome, uh, the success of vital pulp therapy. Hemostatic agent as well, whether uh, sodium hypochloride or chlorhexidine or other types of hemostatic agents. Integrity of the seal permanent restoration, which is very important, because if we cannot get a good seal permanent restoration, we still have an ingress of bacteria to the sites of exposure or the pulpotomy sites, and we will end up with failure. So that's why one surface occlusal carous lesion have more predictable outcome than multi-surface lesion especially in direct pulp capping. Isolation and asepsis also an important. Uh, statements have, uh, I have found that root canal treatment and advanced restorative care together reduce the long-term survival compared to teeth with vital pulp. So now let's talk about the irreversible pulpitis and vital pulp therapy. So let's take the word irreversible pulpitis, mean that the pulp cannot heal or go back to its natural state or uh, a healthy state. So it's irreversible, it cannot go back. But this uh, term often lead to initiation of pulpectomy and root canal treatment according to the AAE. Uh, and state that mature permanent teeth clinically diagnosed with irreversible pulpitis are treated with pulpectomy and root canal filling because inflamed vital pulp is not capable of healing. However, there are a current clinical investigation. They use calcium silicate cement in full pulpectomies for adult teeth, mature permanent teeth, diagnosed with irreversible pulpitis, and they demonstrated a radiographic periapical lesion or a refaction have been treated successfully without pulpectomy and root canal treatment or without pulpectomy and conventional orthograde treatment. Like in Asgari et al. 2013, Asgari et al. 2015, and Taha et al. in 2017. These studies, they bring patients presenting with science symptoms of irreversible pulpitis. And some of the uh, patients have a, a periapical lesion and they perform a complete pulpotomy or full pulpotomy with calcium silicate cements. And the success rate was very high. In irreversible pulpitis, advanced treatment options such as calcium silicate cement pulpotomy should be considered, especially in younger patients. So uh, a new histological evidence, which uh, they call the indolite in one of the editorials, suggests that the pulp diagnosed clinically with irreversible pitis is not necessary to manifest irreversible inflammation histologically. So uh, in Rigochi et al., they found that if you diagnose uh, a tooth with irreversible pitis and then you extract this tooth and you section it and you see histologically, by the way, the histologic examination is the gold standard to assess the inflammation of a tissue. Not the clinical, not the radiograph, but the histological evidence or sectioning is the gold standard to final assessment of the level of inflammation of a specific tissue. 
So they found that if you diagnosed a tooth with irreversible pitis clinically, according to our criteria, lingering pain, spontaneous pain, throbbing pain, and you take this tooth and section it and examine it histologically, you will find only 85% agreement between the clinical results and the histological results. So only 85% of teeth diagnosed with irreversible pulpitis, they have a real irreversible pulpitis histologically. And 15% of these teeth that diagnosed irreversibly, uh, clinically as a reversible pulpitis, they have reversible pulpitis. This means that 15% of teeth diagnosed with irreversible pulpitis are savable and not necessarily devitalized. Also, they found that irreversible inflammation does not extend into the radicular pulp part in some cases. Therefore, it has been proposed to use a new classification of pulpal status by Walter et al. And still, it's a proposal. Still, it uh, depends on a clinical situation, which also will uh, complicate the uh, work of the dentist. As the term irreversible pulpitis do not reflect the actual situation of the whole pulp histologically, because we say that some of the radicular part or some of the coronal part is still healthy. So why you told, uh, why you say about a pulp irreversible pulpitis while still he is capable in some part of it to heal? So the irreversible pulpitis should be complete in all part of the pulp to be considered as irreversible and should be eliminated. So we have some part of the pulp that have the ability to heal because it's have a, 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 a reversible inflammation or it's a healthy pulp tissue. So by uh, the idea of cutting just the disease part and keeping the healthy part uh, is a, a, a new idea and need to be investigated, which has been in investigated uh, in recent years. So this is the study of Ricocci et al, which assess the correlation between clinical and histologic pulp diagnosis. If you diagnose a tooth with reversible pulpitis, you will have a very high chance that histologically it will be reversible. So with the reversible, we have no problem because the agreement is 98% between clinical and histological examination. While in irreversible pulpitis, we have some problem. We have 15% of teeth are reversibly inflamed on histological level. So we should be cautious when we diagnose a, a tooth with irreversible pulpitis, and we should not depend on our clinical diagnosis alone if we are going to do a vital pulp therapy, and we should do an intraoperative assessment uh, again to assess the uh, exact state or status of the pulp. If you can see here, uh, this is a tooth with deep carious lesion. If you can see the histological section, you can see there is a necrosis in the pulp. Why we call the pulp is irreversible? Because there will be a necrosis in the pulp that cannot be healed, and that's why we call the pulp is irreversible. And this will elicit the clinical signs and symptoms of irreversible pulpitis, which is lingering pain uh, and uh, spontaneous pain. And if you can see histologically, uh, the reverse, irreversibility of the pulp is limited to, to a specific area, to the pulp horn and it's not extending to the rest of the pulp, which, which is quite interesting. That means the term irreversible pulpitis is only can be called on this area. That's why there was a questioning about the term irreversible pulpitis, because this area is healthy and it can heal readily. Therefore, it has been proposed to use a new classification, as I say, uh, as the term irreversible pulpitis does not reflect the actual situation. Uh, 
So with the development of pulpotomy intervention aimed at permanently maintaining part of the pulp in the tooth, with signs symptoms of irreversible pulpitis, we have many studies like uh, Kodamat uh, et al, uh, Taha and Ghazali et al, and Taha et al. There have been calls to consider a new, more representative way to classify pulpitis with partial pulpitis, with partial irreversible pulpitis, perhaps a more accurate clinical reflection of the histological picture that I have show, you, show, show it to you. Uh, and this is the picture. So this is a partially inflamed uh, or partially irreversibly inflamed pulp. So this is the editorial by Walter Rita in 2017, and they propose a new classification that can help the dentist to choose the correct decision of treatment depending on the diagnosis. So a glimpse from the editorial, uh, a biologically immune response from even a partially retained pulp could improve the treatment outcome by preventing infection of the apical area and avoid the disadvantage of RCT. They suggest that to classify the pulpitis into initial, mild, moderate, and severe according to treatment needs. For example, initial is to perform indirect pulp treatment, a mild, also indirect pulp treatment, moderate, is to do a partial or complete pulpotomy, and in severe cases or severe pulpitis, a coronal pulpotomy if no prolonged bleeding, otherwise full pulpotomy followed by root canal treatment is performed. However, it's difficult for clinician to uh, use these term because it needs a cautious uh, attention to details of the patient which is our job. So the procedures of vital pulp treatments, we have indirect pulp treatment, by the way, the indirect pulp capping is very old uh, term. You, 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 have no, uh, you, have, you should not use it anymore because capping is covering. You are not capping any pulp in this uh, modality of treatment. You just uh, treating the dentine or covering the dentine that is over the pulp with a medicament versus the case in direct pulp capping, which is a direct covering of the pulp. So we should change the uh, use of the term indirect pulp capping to indirect pulp treatment or management of deep carious lesion to avoid pulp exposure because these uh, treatments aim at the first, uh, 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 aiming primarily to avoid pulp exposure. So according to ESE, to ESE uh, the indirect pulp treatment can be uh, done by one of the, these uh, strategies, either use one stage selective caries removal to soft or firm dentine or a stepwise removal. These are the uh, two alternatives to the old procedure, which was to excavate the, the caries to the hard dentine, which is called non-selective caries tissue removal to hard dentine. That's why I call it NS or abbreviated as NS and uh, selective removal SR and the stepwise is SW. I will, I will go very fast on the indirect pulp treatment because I want to go to the direct pulp treatment uh, or direct pulp capping and pulpotomies. So in order for us to implement this uh, treatment, we need to be familiar about the hardness criterion of the dentine. So the dentine have soft, firm, and hard tactile sensation. And the soft it can be excavated with minimum resistance. Firm is resistance to excavation using hand uh, excavator. Hard dentine should be sound and resistance to probe penetration. So uh, this is uh, adopted from Ogawa et al. And you can see there uh, a histologic section of a carious lesion and a schematic diagram representing the penetration of dentinal tubules. The histologic term, uh, which uh, acquired from histological sectioning, and we have 
the tactile manifestation that we can feel it in the clinical situation. So in a clinical situation, you don't have eyes to see bacteria. You don't have uh, eyes to see the different zones of caries. You just depend on tactile manifestation. So you have soft, leathery, firm, and hard dentin. What they represent, they represent the soft dentin, represent the necrotic zone, contaminated zone with bacteria. And the leathery dentin is representing the demineralized zone, which is affected by the acids of bacteria that demineralize this area and make it a leathery texture. And we have firm dentin, which is the translucent zone, and we have the hard dentin, which is the sound dentin and tertiary dentin. So in order to perform uh, the uh, mentioned uh, techniques for indirect pulp treatment, we should be familiar with the a tactile examination or tactile hardness criterion. So the strategies available depend on the level of dentin hardness. We have non-selective removal to hard dentin. It's no longer advocated uh, according to uh, the ESE and the uh, consensus of cardiologists. The stepwise removal, which is uh, a two visits procedure. The first visit is to soft dentine and the second visit is to remove all the soft dentine after a while, after six months. This is recommended in permanent teeth only. And selective removal to firm dentine. In that case, we leave a dentine pulpally, which feel slight resistant to hand excavator. Remember, the firm dentine is harder than the leathery dentine. And it is recommended in shallow and moderately deep cavities because in shallow and moderate deep cavities, our priority is to, to have a, a, a longevity of the restoration. That's why we perform selective removal to firm dentine. But in cases with deep caries, very deep caries, uh, or a deep cavitated lesion, we stick to the leathery or soft dentine in order to avoid the pulp exposure. This is an introduction to IPT. Uh, there are uh, many indications uh, for uh, stepwise removal, uh, sorry, stepwise removal and selective removal. First of all, the teeth uh, with deep carriage lesion approximating the pulp is very clear. No sign and symptoms of pulp degeneration, which is necrosis. Uh, normal pulp or reversible pulpitis. This is a prequesty. And uh, clinically, however, keep in mind that. A reversible pulpitis may be symptomless in anywhere between 14 and 60 percent of the cases. Radiographic assessment indicate caries to be no deeper than the pulpal quarter. So it's either two-thirds of dentine thickness or three-quarter of dentine thickness. If deeper pulp, if deeper caries, then pulp exposure can be expected. We should uh, uh, also consider that one surface occlusal caries lesion have more predictable outcome compared to multi-surface lesion. The objective of this technique is to protect the pulp uh, from bacteria, uh, protect the vital pulp from cytotoxic effect of restorative material, uh, promote favorable environment, environment for pulpal healing, also uh, eliminate potential residual microorganism, neutralize any acidic, due to the caries defect tissue, remineralize dentine and stimulate the pulp to form tertiary dentine. The idea is to isolate and disturb the possible remaining microorganism under the sealed restoration and prevent its propagation and nutrition reaching these microorganisms. Uh, I, I will leave that because it's, it's uh, taking time, a lot of time, uh, probably um, in another uh, occasion, I will talk about it. Uh, the incidence of pulp exposure decreased by 77% uh, compared to non-selective. So if we remove the dentine to hard dentine, we will have high chances of pulp exposure. So stepwise, uh, selective removal and stepwise significantly decrease the pulp exposure. My, my studies, my clinical trials found that selective removal using carisolve versus rotary bear uh, giving a high success rate uh, compared to the rotary bear. However, uh, if I compare it to other studies, the other studies, they use periapical radiography, but I did use CBCT. That's why I should expect a less success rate 
uh, in my studies compared to other studies. However, I got a 90%, which is equivalent to uh, this uh, study. So uh, selective removal can be very helpful in protecting the survival of the pulp. When I say success rate, I mean the pulp survival after one year. So this is my study published in Dental Research. And you can see the success rate uh, for carisol the group versus the rotary group using selective removal uh, or self-limiting versus conventional caries removal. The carisol kit uh, is a chemomechanical caries tissue removal that remove the caries without uh, removing the affected area or caries affected dentine because it's self-limiting. It will not work on the uh, caries affected area compared to rotary bears. The two years result also show a higher success rate for teeth with uh, treated with carisol, deep caries lesion with carisol, excavated with carisol. And uh, I will move on with this. I have uh, a study, I have do it on uh, Iraqi dentist, also a, a survey study. Uh, I, I have asked them about the strategies they use to deal with the caries tissue removal in deep caries lesion. So what strategies they use? They use non-selective removal to hard dentine, stepwise removal, or, uh, uh, or selective removal. We did found that uh, about 238 dentists participated in the study. It was 70% of them, they perform non-selective removal. And 23.5% uh, they use stepwise removal while selective removal of dentine was done only by 7.5%. Less invasive uh, caries removal, which are the, these two, stepwise and selective removal, associated with being an endodontist or a female or work in a private clinic. So those person, usually they choose uh, uh, conservative uh, or less invasive caries removal technique compared to other persons. In conclusion, Iraqi general dental practitioners prefer invasive strategies for caries tissue removal and management of deep caries lesion. Uh, specialty, place of work, and sex of respondent affected these choices significantly. Now let's talk about the direct pulp capping, which defined as placing a dental material directly on mechanical or traumatic vital pulp exposure and sealing the pulpal wound to facilitate formation of reparative dentine and maintenance of vital pulp. Dr. Enes, uh, are, are we completing or, or no? We, have, we still have uh, about 13 minutes. 13 minutes. Uh, I don't yeah. have the time to finish in, in, in 13 minutes. Um, we can finish it later, maybe tomorrow. We yeah. have also one big session. OK. Okay. If you like, I mean. Yeah, it's 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 fine for me. It's it's fine for me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, great. So uh, we are waiting for questions from our audience. Uh, actually, I have two questions for you. Yeah. Um, I, I saw the uh, study that you have been presenting uh, about the invasion of bacterial invasion of the. Um, Internal tubules. Yeah, uh, the non vital tooth. So if the, the, uh, the study or the authors of this study giving a reason for that, why it's much more um, uh, the bacterial invaded the internal tubule of non-vital tooth? Well, what this, you, what they this is because the non-vital tooth have lost the physiologic action of the pulp. So uh, the dentin pulp complex is very important in promoting the defensive defenses of the tooth against invasion of bacteria. You know, if you have dentine that uh, occupied by odontoblastic process, and this process have fluids and uh, enzymes and glycoproteins that can keep bacterial invasion away 
from dentine or uh, dentinal tubules. So uh, it's very important to uh, have. Yeah, I know that, doctor, yeah. but I mean, what they what they explain the, in the paper, the authors, because I think it's an old one. Yeah, it's it's nineteen ninety five. Four or five, yeah. So what what did they explain at that time? Uh, I I did not read the whole paper, but uh, mm -hmm. the findings was uh, interesting. Yeah, it is. It is for me. It is so interesting because you know that the more, uh, many of the concepts about the dentin pulp complex uh, have been changed since that time. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, I, I was shocking. I, I, I was shocked by, by, by uh, the fact that mentioned in some of the reviews and some of the studies that uh, old articles and old papers, very old, they use the vital pulp therapy to treat teeth with irreversible pulpitis and periapical lesion, and they found a high success rate. So uh, after that, the endodontic associations and societies, they just uh, did not recommend the use of vital pulp therapy anymore. And instead, they use uh, or recommend to do uh, uh, root canal treatment for teeth with irreversible pulpitis. It was, it, I was shocked by that, really. Yeah. Yeah, also, um, uh, I also impressed about the, um, the thoughts that you have thrown during this lecture about that the age is not affecting the vital pulp therapy, where I always um, like found in the literature that the cellularity of the tooth is decreased with time because of the um, deposition of the secondary dentine uh, throughout the life. So as the number of cells and the uh, amount of the pulp tissue uh, has uh, insig insignificantly uh, affecting the vital pulp therapy? Well, um, the age, they concluded that because many studies have been done to assess the uh, age factor on the outcome of vital pulp therapy. They, they, they was thinking that age is uh, a, a predictor of failure and success, but they did not find any association between age and the outcome. And uh, uh, there is no limit for the age to affect the outcome of the vital pulp therapy. Uh, uh, but still, at um, younger age, it's, it's, it's recommended to do vital pulp therapy in younger age, but on a clinical trial basis, there is uh, no uh, evidence to support that. Okay. Okay, that's great, I think. Yeah. I also uh, think about the terms about the reversible and irreversible pulpitis. Yes. Uh, I, I don't think that they are actually uh, reflecting the image of the what's inside the pulp. Um, I think they are like um, using the clinical signs and symptoms, um, which is a presence in each case, uh, and reflecting these on the what is inside the pulp. It's exactly. like a term, yeah, reflecting the clinical condition rather than the um, what's inside the histological, the real. Exactly, um, what you are saying is completely right, because these terms have been adopted to help the clinician to decide their treatment. So it is an operational, operational terms. It's not real histological term. It's not describing the status of the pulp, but describing the ability of the pulp to heal if he receive a specific treatment. So uh, in order for you to decide this tooth has a pulp, have the ability to repair, so you call it reversible pulpitis. So it's an operational, it's an operational 
terms. It's not real histologic term, but to help the clinician to decide their treatment option. Yeah, yeah. I think all these terms uh, could be uh, changed from now to I think five years. From yeah, now. yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, so, probably. I think so more histological evidence is coming. Yeah, hopefully we will find our, our Iraqi dentists <laughs> in yeah. our uh, mother school in, in yeah. Iraq, in Baghdad University. Hopefully we we, we can find the new terms. Yeah. Uh, do you know, Dr. Enes, uh, the, the problem, why the, we are in dentistry use this term? Because we don't have single test or uh, we don't have available, readily, easy, applicable test that can give us the state of the pulp. We have, yeah. for example, oximetry or we have a uh, Doppler uh, I can't remember the name. The Doppler laser fluor fluorometry is fluorometry. Yeah. fluorometric. Yeah, it's it's uh, also uh, have been found that it can predict the vitality of the pulp, but mm. its application on a clinical setting is time consuming uh, and uh, costly. That's why yeah. uh, it's not available uh, everywhere. But uh, this is also uh, belong to the shortcoming of the tools of dentistry in addition to the material yeah we need to improve the biomarkers i think <laughs> yeah 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 exactly yeah. exactly biomarkers can help a lot in in, in, in this field okay uh, we haven't had any question till now i think um, we have done uh, sorry there is a question uh, no, it's a, one of, uh, of comments that uh, from Dr. Bilal, a very interesting lecture. Thank you so much, uh, lecture, lecturer and organizers. Thank you, Dr. Bilal, and thanks for all audience. I think we have done today. Uh, we still have another day tomorrow uh, for our continuous uh, educational course. And also the day after tomorrow will be the, uh, our exam the end of our course. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you for your efforts in organizing this course and thank you for your uh, lots of effort in uh, preparing this lecture, uh, quite uh, informative and uh, I will, I, I have no words to acknowledge your efforts all the time in, in our department and in our scientific committee. Thank you very much and hope you uh, all the best in the future and in your research. Thank you very much, Dr. Ennis. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.